Hello again and welcome to the county seat. I'm Chad Booth. You know, the last few weeks have seen several fires flare up around the state. Four of them are burning now as we tape the show. We've seen homes destroyed and watersheds affected, similar to last year. The difference is this season has started much earlier. The popular notion is that climatic changes have brought on a drought that has rendered the forest more vulnerable to burning. But to assume that logic is to see only part of the story, as is the condition and density of the forest that dictates how wide a fire will spread. So let's start our discussion about forests by learning about the different theories for running one. Here's Rhea. So here's a question for you. What is the life cycle of a forest? In other words, how long does it take a forest to grow from seedlings to old growth trees? Well, it depends upon three factors. First is the species of the tree. As an example, a cottonwood tree grows much faster than a Douglas fir. Second is the climate. Trees along the coastal region might grow to maturity up to 40 years faster than the same species of trees near us in the Rocky Mountains. And the third and most important fact is how you raise the forest. Let's look at three models for managing a forest. First is the hands-off method or Mother Nature method. Untouched, a forest will go from fire to fire ready in an average cycle of about 180 years. This is an average, the number will change substantially by virtue of the primary species. By the time it reaches maturity, it will be old, prone to disease, overly dense, and ready to burn again. This method is a brutal way to manage the ecosystem of a forest. It has negative impacts on watershed, wildlife, and for a short period of time, air quality. The second system is the European model. This is how most forests in Europe are managed. In this model, the cycle begins when large tracts of trees are clear-cut harvested and new seedlings planted to restart the growth cycle. This produces whole sections of forest with trees of a single species that are all about the same age and thin to allow for maximum growth. When they are at maturity, they are all cut down, replanted, and the entire cycle starts again. The third system is the selective treatment harvest method. Many believe this method is the best for sustainability. It mixes species of trees along with shrubs and grasses and mixes them in different densities with stands of trees of different ages. The idea of this method is to keep about 40 seed bearing trees per acre in any given stand and harvest the rest. The landscape is a mixture of open space and stands of trees. This serves as a domestic and wildlife habitat and gives the trees a survivability buffer between stands in case of insect infestation or fire. Under the selective treatment model, the stands are checked about every 25 years and selectively thinned to maintain the best 40 seed bearing trees in the stand to make sure that one species doesn't become dominant over another. The selective treatment harvest model can shorten the seedling to mature tree cycle by up to 40 years and leave the section healthy through the entire cycle. In this model, the soil stays anchored and provides cover and forage for the rest of the ecosystem, with no catastrophic episodes like clear cutting or fire to critically disrupt the ecosystem. The separated stands act as an insurance agent against catastrophic fire and insect invasion while providing a steady supply of usable fiber that can be commercially used to better our lives for building material, fuel and cellulose fiber, which can be used in many applications. Western forests could be considered as the treasure of the West, and the forest lands the bank that holds them. They are beautiful to look at and a renewable resource to make rural economies diverse and self-sustaining. But as with any treasure, there are villains trying to get at them. Metaphorically, fire, if not applied properly, can be the bank robber. That wipes the treasure out all at once. The disease is the embezzler who slowly steals the wealth one tree at a time. A sound stewardship plan is like the bank guard and the auditor who keeps the treasure safe. All we need to do is find a way to make good stewardship make good sense for the nation, for the local communities, and the trees. Chad has some ideas on that coming up in our discussion panel. For the county seat, I'm Maria Rossi Booth. Look south to adventure. Look south to beauty. Look south to San Juan County. Out here, the road goes on forever, 
and what you'll find will change how you see the world. Climb on your OHV and discover forgotten landscapes and vistas that challenge the imagination. From Blanding and Monticello to the cliff faces of Monument Valley, we're open and ready for you to explore. San Juan County, Utah's Canyon Country. There's a little place on a Utah map where I was raised, where my heart's at, where the sagebrush grows wild and high, and the stars come out at night. In the basin with the youth reservation, skin starvation, that Duchesne County life. If you're looking for gold at the end of the rainbow, you'll probably be disappointed because in Paiute County, the only thing you'll find at the end of a rainy day is the promise of adventure. Highway 89 is your access point through Marysville and the historic trails of Bullion Canyon. Find yourself in the mountains one minute and the desert the next as you follow in the footsteps of the pioneers. Whitewater raft, fish, hike, all within a few minutes of a comfortable bed and a warm meal. Find out why the world has made Paiute County its off-road destination. Paiute County, the place where the rainbow ends. Welcome back to the county seat. Our topic today is taking a look at different ways to manage forests. There's been some talk and there have been comparisons about different entities on public lands and how they work. And we're going to kind of blend that into a concept who's really been pioneered in part by uh, Kane County Commissioner Jim Matson, who has a long and extensive background in forestry. And Jim, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we had a current uh, forester consultant uh, who was supposed to be with us today, but uh, last minute health issues stopped him from joining us. We're going to carry on without him. So I will try to play devil's advocate for some of the things that Tom talked about that didn't quite align with yours, but we'll get into a conversation. Okay. So let's talk, let's start right with the title. You're talking about forest stewardships. Explain the concept. And, and also coupled with community, forest stewardship, you know. Uh -huh. So what we want to do is, is kind of couple, if we can, our forested landscapes with those communities that are in and around and adjacent to these large forest tracts. They're the direct beneficiaries today, and they also ought to have a role in what the direction is as we go ahead and manage toward healthy forests in a sustainable fashion. There would be some people who would argue that if that if you clear cut an area, you, you scarred its natural beauty. And so it seems to me that the argument really is about aesthetics, uh, that, that the environmental and recreational community say, well, we just, we don't want that forest mowed down. Uh, so what's your answer to that? Let's say that I was a 25 or 30 year old forester and I was given a track of, let's say 80,000 acres to manage. Mm -hmm. In a career, in a 30, 40 year career, I could change the character, the structure, and the nature of that whole forest stand, and you wouldn't know it at the end of that 40-year period. How would, I, how would I not know it? I mean, some people would say, well, how dare you think that you should change Mother Nature? If, if you can go in there in such a way and, 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 and remove the trees that in, in one sense or another are either out of phase or are or not contributing to the overall picture, uh, but what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about is that we could do it in such a fashion that most of us are, are windshield observers. And as you drive to and through the forest over a decade or two decades or three decade, decades, that forest character can change if we, if we don't see it. But if you have a large area that's been cut over or clear cut as you said earlier, right away you know what's happened to it. But a large fire is as devastating as a, as a big clear cut. So we've got to deal with, with the natural presence of that forest, its forest structure, and, and what it's contributing. Okay, so let's, let's take an example of this. Uh, let's look at West Yellowstone. Okay, the Yellowstone fire was the, I mean, it was a game changer for public lands, and they, they said, well, we're going to let it burn, it's going to be natural, we're not going to fight it. And it wiped out that tall stand of lodgepole pines that you used to, you used to basically drive through a lodge 
pole tunnel till you got to the Madison River Junction. Mm -hmm. And then it was all gone. It was nothing but, but cinders. And even some, uh, most of the tree trunks within a period of two or three years mm -hmm. toppled over and you just had a barren landscape. Mm -hmm. It's now been, what, 35, 40 years since that fire? When was that, 87 or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it's 30 plus, yes. 30 plus years. And you just now are at a point where you have what I would call a young, maturing forest. Mm -hmm. You don't have any tall trees, none. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are probably 60, 70 trees per acre, and there's other growth in there. Mm -hmm. But the trees are starting to become predominant in that landscape again, but not tall. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you're talking about the stewardship community stewardship program where somebody is selectively trying to maintain it, how different does his project look than that one? I, I think when you have those kind of uh, disruptive structural changes, you're going to be able to tell it and notice it over, over time. But let's say that we decide that we're going to harvest with a group selection approach to it. And so we're, we're taking a look at this clump of trees and its age and its structure and this one and this one. And we're going to say, basically, we want to be able to take and move this mosaic around over time and you thin it out so that you always have a forested canopy over top. But there will be so many trees per acre, whether it's 20 or 80 at any one stage or the other. But as, as you remove material, you take material out that has commercial value. It helps pay for the processes and you don't have to go to the banks of the Potomac to borrow money. Do you think it's actually self-sustainable where the cost of maintaining the forest because of the product pulled out Absolutely. is going to equal the, the cost to maintain it? Absolutely. And it was going on before until we got tied up into these NEPA battles over, over the NGOs and their approach to wanting to be able to determine outcomes. And what happens? We stalled the whole thing out. Okay. And so explain how that process worked. What, what, what happened there? There, there was a, an approach toward managing forested areas that would say that in a given period of time that the removals uh, would, would equal, uh, let's say, 10, 15 million feet per year. Mm -hmm. And if you kept that on a steady schedule, and, it's, and it should be less than millions of board feet per year, but more about acres treated and the objectives that we're going to put in on the ground for the watersheds and the, and the, and the tree species that are there, then we would be looking at, at the means by which how do we then make those selections and do it in a cogent enough fashion so that the courts of the, and NEPA challenges don't unnecessarily, the appeals and lawsuits, choke it down. So how different is that doing this community stewardship program? How, how is that different than just doing timber sales to achieve that goal through the Forest Service? I, I think when you, when you hang a, a, a commercial label on it, it naturally takes on a, an air of skepticism as, to some, as, as opposed to something that would say the beneficiaries of this are the families, the communities that are in and around that need the tourism that need that wood material and they need to have jobs for their people. And the way to do this thing is to just say basically you have working circles. Mm -hmm. And here's another working circle. And in those the areas there, then you determine a forest management approach to whether it's, it's going to be a selective harvest or it's going to be even age harvest or, or whatever it takes. And then you say this is what we're going to offer. But you're also going to say to that particular community, you come up with your family stewards Mm -hmm. that are going to live there and are going to take on these, these contracts and these jobs to do this thing. There, there's a working model for this right now, and it's called grazing. <laughs> this simply mirrors that same approach. So as to whether you had four or five contract entities or, or you had one large or one mill, they would be responsible for going out, making an assessment, and then making an offer back to the forest mm -hmm. and saying, we're going to do X in this period of time, and we'll pay you this for it. And so, the, so they would actually be paying for the process, kind of like when they would do timber sales, except that it would be over a longer period of time? It, 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 over a period of time, but there would be annual increments mm -hmm. based on what's removed. And that would be to some prescription that actually enhances the situation so that you don't end up with a forest that's standing ready to collapse through either a insect attack and or fire. So what does a healthy forest look like? Well, that, that's, a, that's a good one because he, to me, it, it has several age classes in it, move, you know, scattered around on it. You might even have two or three different species. But you look up in the crowns and you can tell because they're all cone-shaped. But if they're topped off and flat and no foliage, that, that particular forest is, is going through a phase where it's going to eventually drop or collapse. Really? Yes. So 
to get that cone shape, the trees, if I'm guessing, they need light. And so you got to have them thin enough that they can fill out at the bottom and, and create that cone shape at the top of the trees. And moisture. And, and, and some trees need more shade than others. More, mm -hmm. other, other tree species need more sunlight. So you get a mixture of that as you go along through that. Does it have open space in the middle of it? It, it sure does and sure can and sure should. And, and an edge in the interior. And then at a particular point in time when it's restocked, so that it goes from, let's say, having anything from 80 to 100 trees per acre, as it thins itself out, you probably end up with a net number of trees out there of somewhere around 40. And that acre has enough moisture, and enough sunlight, and other conditions that allows it with its own productivity to grow up over that period of time. And then it goes on into something that can be 18 and 24 and 36 inches in diameter. Mm -hmm and 80 to 150 feet tall. And then, and then you pull those trees out and- Selectively. And selectively, and so you've got, you basically have within a, a 60 or 70 acre area, a little bit of everything. Yes, in actuality, what you wanna do is have it in such a condition so that you don't have fuel ladders from the littlest trees to the next size trees so that when the ground fire comes through the grass, it goes to the top. So you need breaks in there so that it does not do that and you have time to react to a ground fire. Those are all things that contribute to that particular mosaic as you select for those conditions over a 150, 100, 200 year period. You know, the problem is that we don't live to be 300 years old. Right. You know, we look at it through the eyes of what we see right now today without realizing there's other conditions coming. So, so that's think, the opportunity that's out there. So do you think that a lot of this environmental uh, meandering into land policy has to do with the fact that we're looking at a life cycle that's 300 years and we're trying to interpret it into 70? Or, or, or 20 to 70 or whatever the, the right. case may be. Yes, I think we're just very, if you will, short-sighted without knowing what the end result could possibly be. One last question. If this community forest stewardship program had been in place 10, 12 years ago, would the outcome of the Steed Sawmill in, in Escalante been different? Yes, and the, and the one in Beaver, you know, and, and still being able to keep the one in, in Panguitch functioning, you know, as, as we look ahead at this, yes. You still would, see, in, instead of having people knocking heads over a 15 acre, 1,500 acre tract or 2,000 acre tract, you'd say basically, all right, we're gonna talk about working circles and it's gonna have so many acres and so much standing forest capacity that needs so much activity and so much work, we want you to give us a proposal for a 20 year period. Hmm. And then when that period is, is, is defined, then you, then you write a contract and then you write the processes by which it's carried out and then the removals are balanced on that and then the payments start taking place. And then the, and then the Forest Service still has some oversight capacity to make sure that the standards of what it's supposed to look like at the end of the 20 years is what they envisioned. Absolutely. And once again, they have a working model for this now in their livestock grazing programs. Okay. With AUMs and operators. It's a fascinating concept. I hope, I hope people listen. I do too. I'm going to work on it. <laughs> Thanks, Jim, for taking the time. You Thank you for uh, joining us. We'll be back right now. We'll take a look uh, a little closer at what healthy versus unhealthy versus burnt looks like here on the county seat. We'll be right back. For seven years, Utah's Community Voice has been the county seat, a program that looks beyond politics to spotlight the issues and stories that really matter to you and your community. Now you can help set Utah's agenda for the future by joining the conversation. Become a county seat sponsor and help support those conversations that are critical to the future of state government. Contact us at 801-947-8888 to make your contribution to help the voice of Utah be heard like never before. In a place that is beyond words, there is nothing to be said, except take your time in Bryce Canyon country. Too often we find ourselves in shoes like these, or these. Wouldn't it be nice to change into something more like this, or this? How about these? 
Put on whatever shoes you prefer and come to Beaver County. We have exactly the adventure you need to put under them. So the next time you want to change out of these, come to Beaver County where you can jump into a pair of these. Beaver County, Utah. Lace up for adventure. Welcome back to the county seat. You know, we were only able to air about 12 minutes of our conversation on community stewardships. If you can get the time to catch the entire 24 minute conversation, it is an excellent investment in time and understanding of this issue. One of the things that was hard for Jim to convey in our conversation is what a healthy forest is supposed to look like, as opposed to what we think it should look like and opposed to what it does look like up close after a fire. So prior to our studio discussion, Commissioner Matson took us out on the ground to see for ourselves firsthand. Best conditions that we could have in here would be tree densities that typically do not exceed 60 trees per acre. It, as a result of the crowns interlocking, the material on the ground, the fire that would, that would start on the downhill side or on the southwest side could roll through here at a fairly fast clip during drought and dry conditions that would be anywhere from five to 10 miles per hour. The, the conditions that we're gonna take a look at next is in a managed stand where it's pole sized trees, which has less trees per acre and the interlock and the crowns are not interlocking and if anything they contribute to openness and therefore we wouldn't have a crown fire that would start at the ground level and sweep right to the top and then right across the landscape. As we continue to stroll along we, we see that the older bigger trees that were taken out in those previous harvests are represented here by these stumps. This stand in this area has probably had three total entries up until the, the current time. And so it's, it's had, uh, you know, a, I think a thinning operation in here where they've thinned it out to the point that we we're trying to obtain somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 trees per acre. Uh, you do not see a fuel ladder situation here where we have lots of little trees that stair step themselves on up to about 20 feet tall. So if you have a ground fire or some kind of an event like that in this particular stand, it's not likely that it'll take the whole thing out and you're able to get on top of it before the fire takes it all completely out. So for all, I'd give this, this particular stand a, uh, an A. I think it's in good shape. Th this is the shingle fire. It's about six years old. It's man-caused. It started off on one of these canyon uh, points down here to the south of us. I think overall when you look at this you can see the, the clumps of this. Uh, based on the area that we were in before this is much the same situation with a blackjack ponderosa pine intermediate sized uh, tree making up so many clumps. If, if it had had previous treatments in here we, we wouldn't have had near the losses that we have had. So as a result uh, it, it's just kind of like you know take care of it now or you'll have to take care of it later. So it, it, it requires activity and uh, forest management. I will be back with some closing thoughts in just a minute. Antelope Island State Park. Think of it as a treasure island because of the unique activities and treasured experiences you'll enjoy there. The 25th annual Antelope by Moonlight Bike Ride is coming to Antelope Island State Park Friday, July 27th at White Rock Bay. Tailgate party begins at 7.30 p.m. Bike ride begins at 10 p.m. under a full moon. Register now by going to antelopebymoonlight.com. Discover nature, buffalo, historic gar ranch, and more at Antelope Island State Park. Visit plaindavis.com slash antelope today.
All local products have a story of magical places, real people, and delicious recipes spanning generations. So go ahead and discover flavors you've never tasted and friends you never knew you had. Utah's own Discover Local Food. What would you do with an extra day in Utah Valley? Explore the Wasatch Mountains? Snap a family photo at Bridal Veil Falls. Cool off on Utah Lake or the Provo River. No matter what you're searching for, you can find it in Utah Valley. Bring everyone together. Welcome back to the county seat. As discussions and ideas were floating back and forth between Commissioner Matson, forest expert Tom Quigley and myself regarding this episode, there was some concern about equating community stewardship agreements in the forest to grazing allotments on public land. Although they would work in a very similar fashion, for the most part, See, grazing allotments are a win-win proposition as the BLM gets someone else to bear the cost and responsibility to keep the range in good health, and they in turn can make a few dollars by running cattle to keep the grass in check. But somehow, if the private sector makes a cent off of government land, the popular thought is that it's a rip-off to the American public. Now, this is a silly notion, but it is pervasive in federal land management. Removing the grazing leases and the range will still have to be treated to keep wild grasses, forbs, and junipers from running amok. Except instead of getting paid, the U.S. Treasury is going to have to pay out. The same is true with the forest. Heaven forbid you could let anyone remove fiber from the forest before it is rotted past any commercial value and you have to pay a contractor to dispose of it. The same thinking can be applied to horses, drilling, and a host of other activities that have a viable private sector value that would allow Uncle Sam to get some cash back from Mother Nature. But to many, such folly should be criminal. We have to rethink how we re perceive the resources, particularly the renewable ones, that we have on our public lands and find a way for the land to be self-sustaining and the cost of getting there to be the same, self-sustaining. That's my two cents worth for today. Thanks for joining us. Please help us go and grow by following us on YouTube and Facebook and sharing our posts with your friends. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on the County Seat.